Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about some candles results on gradients. Gradients, we, ha we haven't studied gradients that much at, at higher redshift. And this is the first sample of 2,000 galaxies, which gives us a statistical view of, of gradients. Why study gradients? Star formation gradients, this is specific star formation rate. Well, specific star formation rate compares galaxies and parts of galaxies in a very sensitive way. The numbers are similar to one another, easy to remember, in contrast to star formation rates, et cetera. There are other good reasons for thinking in terms of specific star formation rather than star formation, or in addition to star formation. Let me stress that a good way of thinking about the way galaxies assemble their mass is to think about star, specific star formation as a function of radius. If that is constant, then the radius of the galaxy isn't changing. The only thing that's happening is that the surface density is increasing by the same amount at all radii. So you can think of a galaxy with constant specific star formation versus radius as one that is neither growing inside out or outside in. The other kind of gradient I'm going to talk about is dust gradients. And why do we care about dust? Because it profoundly alters what we see at UV and optical wavelengths. In some galaxies, the net AV that we're getting from the Calzetti SED fitting method is two magnitudes in the V band and can be effectively infinite in the ultraviolet band. And anticipating one of my conclusions from uh, a minute or two ahead, um, I'm very worried about our whole treatment of dust, especially in galaxies that, um, that, that, that have large amounts of dust using the standard method. And I was delighted to hear the cautionary note from Reinhardt this morning on the same topic. Um, so the net result is I, I think it's possible that our, a lot of what we're doing about galaxy stellar populations, masses, and structural parameters are kind of resting on a foundation of sand until we understand the death, dust problem better. Um, dust can be interesting, though, from the standpoint of geometry. If you have higher absorption, higher AV, in edge-on galaxies, that's a sign that you, you really have disks rather than prolate elongated galaxies. Here's a picture of that. Red galaxies are edge-on, and they're dustier, the blue are face-on. This is kind of reassuring in a mass range and a redshift range in which you see this pattern. I call it the disk pattern. But that's not seen at all masses and radii. Here's an example of very massive galaxies at a z of 2, and you don't see that pattern at all. Um, it, there's really very little tendency for the edge-on galaxies to be dustier. And what's really missing here and very scary is um, low dust galaxies that are face-on. Those blue dots there are all quite highly reddened. All right, so what I'm going to use to discuss dust and star formation today is the UVJ diagram. And it was invented to distinguish between star forming and quiescent galaxies. The elongation of the star forming galaxies is thought to be this dust parameter here, which follows the Calzetti reddening vector. Um, not so well known, but emerging is the fact that the crosswise dimension also has carries information. And that's uh, information on the specific star formation rate. So the Candles team has done SED fitting using 10 different methods, similar to FAST, but and all using declining tau models and a Calzetti foreground screen. That's crucial. And in these are global properties, UVJ, from Candles galaxies. And um, here's the pattern that you get of specific star formation rate. You get stripes that go this way. And this is the pattern that you get for a visual absorption, you get uh, vertical bands that go this way. And the reasons for these things are well understood. Now, what I'm going to talk about today, Abishai is going to be disappointed because I'm really concentrating on these objects here. And those are the objects that are still in the star forming band near the ridge line of the star forming main sequence. We have separate work that's working on galaxies that are fading or compactifying, going out. And uh, we'll talk about those separately. But today, I'm talking about the, the long-lived phase of galaxies on the main sequence. OK, so now one thing we found more recently is that UVI is as effective here 
as UVJ is. And that is good because uh, you can't measure UVJ out at Z of 2 with high resolution pictures of galaxies because um, the WIF C3 camera only goes to H band. So by dint of considerable effort, we have established that we can measure UVI out to a redshift of 1.4. And it calibrated, it looks like this. It turns out it has almost the same amount of information as UVJ does. And so here, in a nutshell, are the results for, for gradients. When you look at uh, an aperture photometry catalog and look at how we go from center to edge of the galaxy, uh, that's what they all look like. Um, and it doesn't matter whether they're less reddened or more reddened, the pattern is always the same. So to summarize here, radial gradients, as we go out in a galaxy, we see declining dust and we see constant star formation rate. Why do I say that? It's because these gradients follow the stripes in the specific star formation. OK. So here actually is the picture. In a grid here of stellar mass going this way, redshift going that way, these dotted dashed lines are the Calzetti vectors. And here are the gradients. They're all following the Calzetti vector, which means specific star formation rate is constant and dust is declining. Here's a picture of absorption gradients. And they all seem to have about the same functional form, especially if you think in terms of log AV rather than just AV. Just to illustrate that, here is an average AV and a change in AV out to two effective radii. And you can see that they're sort of proportional to one another, reflecting the fact that in logarithmic form, uh, the pattern of dust is similar. Log AR of, of radius has constant shape. Okay, so now let me show you the results from candles. These are the final absorption gradients for galaxies of different masses at uh, this redshift bin, Z of 1.0 to 1.2. Here are the, here's um, little galaxies and here's big galaxies. That's what we get with candles. Okay. All right. And now on the same picture is um, Sandro's measurement from this morning. All right. And uh, he's at Z of 2. And we're around Z of 1. And they, they pretty much agree. Okay. Now, however, so very surprising is the result from Nelson et al. Sandra referred to that, measuring using the bomber decurrent. She gets, Erica Nelson gets very, very steep inner dust and an outer galaxy that's very transparent. <laughs> so let me point out two big problems with this with this graph. The first is, how is it that these methods here, which are basically using the continuum light, can give so much more dust than the H-alpha method? And let me point out that it's conventional wisdom in this field that the H-alpha method always gives more dust than the continuum. And here we see in the outer parts of these galaxies is exactly the opposite. That's point number one. Point number two is, how can these AV profiles be so flat? AV is proportional to amount of dust column density of dust, all other things being equal. Well, not shown here, but true, is that these mass profiles are falling by factors of 10 to 30. So that's the other big puzzle of dust in these galaxies that I just don't understand. How is it that the stellar density is falling dramatically, and yet the interstellar medium, or at least the dust component of it, is almost flat? Big problem. All right, next is what do the star formation gradients look like? Um, I almost said we correct the data for the dust, but no, that's not how it works with the UVJ method. You don't correct, you actually measure the location in UVJ, and those two numbers give you dust and specific star formation rate. You just read it off of the diagram. So we do that as a function of radius, and this is what the gradients look like. These are different masses at different redshifts. There's a one aberrant curve here. But everybody else is flat. And that's the takeaway message I want you to remember, is that specific star formation rate gradients within the errors are flat. So here's the candles result, these four solid lines looking flat. Here is Sandro's result, within the errors also flat. And finally, here is the results from Nelson, corrected using her dust and they turn out to be flat with some uncertainty. There's a huge correction, 
in her values. The equivalent widths are very low, but if you correct them for her measured dust, you wind up with a specific star formation rate that's flat. Okay, we've seen constant specific star formation rate before. It's the rule on the bottom low mass end of the star forming main sequence. Strongly star forming galaxies, which are low mass galaxies, have a slope here in this diagram that's consistent with constant specific star formation rate. And we even think we have a theory for this. This is a very simple galaxy formation model that we've worked on here at Santa Cruz, led by Aldo Rodriguez Puebla, and we call it Shark. And it's a simple bathtub model. It says that the halos accrete some mass, including some gas, and the star formation rate follows that to first order. And so here in different panels is shown these, the mass accretion rate onto halos of different mass as a function of time. And this red line that you see here shows you specific constant halo mass accretion rate. And that, in this model, would translate to specific star formation rate. So this kind of pattern explains in a kind of natural way why the star forming main sequence has constant specific star formation rate before galaxies start to go out at the top end. We've also seen constant specific star formation rate inside galaxies. This is a study by Stan Wootz a couple of years ago. He looked at galaxies around Z of 1. He looked in clumps and he looked between clumps and he plotted the star formation rate versus the local clump surface density and got a rule here that has um, a slope that's rather close to specific star formation rate. So now we can plot all of our, our uh, radial lines here in the same sort of diagram. Here's all our galaxies together, all 16 of them, 16 bins of mass and redshift. Plot versus the local stellar density in the galaxies. This is the star formation rate. And collectively, they, they, they obey very strongly this, this constant star formation rate law. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now constant star formation rate's been seen inside galaxies. This is a new scaling law, not between galaxies, but inside galaxies over a wide range of mass, 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 11, from uh, 0 to 2 RE, and over this redshift range, 0.4 to 1.4. So let me close by emphasizing a couple of things. In these data, when you're on the main sequence, strongly star forming, there's no sign of bulge quenching in main sequence ridge, ridge line galaxies. But bulges do slow down at some point, and exactly how they do that as part of the fading process is, is TBD. But you don't see it at, in this phase of galaxy evolution. I'm just about to end. So let, let me end then with, with this cautionary note. All of this depends on the Calzetti law. And um, I'm just completely mystified about how a galaxy can look completely transparent in H alpha and have one to two magnitudes of continuum absorption at the same radius. I submit that we do not understand these galaxies and we don't understand the reddening in them, and I'm very worried that the problem might be sufficiently serious that we're actually messing up the radial structure of these objects. The radii are affected by the dust. The central surface densities possibly affected by the dust. And maybe even the stellar masses. Stellar masses are supposed to be sacred, but uh, I don't think we've tested well enough how robust they are against reddenings of this sort. I'll say finally that people have tried to to match the Calzetti law in hydro models and failed. So we have a lot of work to do theoretically before we can be confident that we're really understanding the evolution of these distant galaxies. Thank you. Um, so uh, just wanted to add to this kind of laundry list of things that are affected by dust. We've been doing work both at low redshift with Sloan coupled to Wise, um, and at intermediate redshift with Cosmos coupled to the longer wavelength Spitzer data. And in addition to all the things you described being affected by, by dust, 
it, it turns out that the structural metrics, for example, Sersich index or a concentration index, are strongly inclination dependent. So you can choose things at long wavelength that are otherwise identical apart from inclination and watch their search index get lower as you go more and more towards edge on. So yep. that's also affected. We, in the process of this work, we did some work with radio transfer models and we also ended up with very flat AV profiles, whereas the dust profile itself was actually quite centrally what concentrated. Profile? What dust the, profile? The, the optical depth of the dust, the optical depth profile was quite peaked but because of radio transfer effects, AV ended up not being very steep. So it's, you know, it's consistent with this idea that when you get optically thick, it's very, very hard to see at wavelengths shorter than... We just might be seeing the outer yeah. skin of exactly. these galaxies, exactly. really. We just might not be seeing into the inside at all. Yep. Time for another question. So if I understand correctly, this is from the ridge of the star forming sequence. Yes. So if you uh, repeat this experiment for galaxies parallel to that sequence approaching quenched uh, region, what yes. will happen? Yes, that's, that's the, our work in progress. Okay. Another thing that is going to appear shortly is that we have this aperture photometry catalog and we've measured specific star formation rate and dust, but we can also measure mass. And so it will be very interesting, as Eric just mentioned, to find out whether or not the CIRSIC indices in the mass catalog, will the radii in the mass catalog change as a function of, of uh, radius? Yeah. OK. OK, if there are no more pressing questions, we'll move on. We should get you on. 